uh, we're going to be looking at preparing the young and uh, tender. <clears throat> Last week we uh, basically covered the background to Solomon's uh, birth, the sort of the promise made to David, his father, that he would have a son called Solomon and that would build the temple for God. Um, we saw the process that David had to go through for Solomon to be born and accepted, um, which is the main thing, be accepted by God. Um, we left our story with um, this man, Adonijah, which we re read about in um, First of Kings 1, which I didn't realise was so long, by the way, Phil. Apologies for that. Should have sort of chopped it a bit. Um, but yeah, we saw that this man, Adonijah, is planning to usurp um, David as king on the throne. And we saw last week that Adonijah had gathered, or we can see, we read that in that reading, that he has gathered uh, his, oh, well, he's gathered um, at Enrogel. Uh, with all the king's sons, and it says in uh, verse 7 there of uh, chapter 1, that he conferred with Joab. So this is Joab, the son of Zeruiah. This is, um, as we know, this is David's mighty captain, um, his main man. And he's with him. He's got Abiathar the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. So now we have a case where this man, um, Adonijah, who's decided that he, has, he thinks he's got the right for the throne, um, he's got some followers, um, some people very close to David, um, and they've decided that uh, the old man needs persuading um, who the next king is going to be. Um, uh, yes, well, I chucked that timeline in there, but I'm not going to deal with that now. I got a few comments um, during the week from people um, wanting me to explain the timeline, but I don't think we've got time tonight. Um, so I think I'll skip that, but if you've got any questions about the timeline, probably none of you do, that's fine, just come to me later. Um, okay, so this is the two parties. <clears throat> okay, it's, uh, verse 8 tells us that there was uh, some who did not go with Adonijah. We see that these are the people with David, Zadok the priest, uh, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, of course, um, he would have definitely stay with David. Uh, Shimei, Rei, and David's mighty men. Um, and we learn also about the Cherethites and the Pelethites a bit later on. Um, and the last son, the only son that didn't follow Adonijah, which was, of course, Solomon himself. So Adonijah had uh, many men with him. Um, a lot of the king's sons, uh, all of the king's sons, sorry, went with him. Um, and decides now is the time to make the big move against David for the throne. And we're told that he slaughters a heap of cattle and sheep and oxen by the stone of Zoheleth, um, which is by Enrogel. And it's an interesting, this place, this uh, Zoheleth, the stone of Zoheleth. It's called, uh, in some translations, the serpent stone or uh, the rolling stone, which sort of appears to be a stone that um, men had to lift to show off their strength. It was like a bit of an Iron Man sort of thing going on, um, to show who is a mighty man. Um, it's in close proximity to the city, pretty close there, so they could have um, just be out of sight uh, before putting their plans into action. It seems David has no idea what's going on. He's all huddled up in bed. He's not feeling great. Um, he's obviously too old to see what's going on outside of his house and all this activity that's occurring. Nathan obviously knows what's going on. I'm, it's, uh, it's happening right under David's nose, and somebody has to do something. So Nathan knows what's going on um, because he goes in verse 11. We read there that Nathan spake to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign? And David, our Lord, knoweth it not. So he basically, it's like, haven't you heard that Adonijah's putting himself as king instead of, of Solomon? Come on, go to him. You should, you've got to tell him that the throne will be taken away. All, the, all the, our, our lives, your life, is all at risk here. He's dangerous. He's gathered people around him um, to take the throne. Go and go to David. Tell him now. Um, and I will come in afterwards and confirm these words. So that's what Bathsheba does. He goes to the king and in verse 15, where the old king is being comforted by Abishag. He was, he was old. He was sick. And this is why Abishag was there to comfort him. Um, to keep him warm and well. Um, it seems a perfect time for Adonijah to take advantage because this is, is a weak king. It's just completely opposite to what, um, especially people like Joel who've seen him as a mighty warrior, completely opposite to that. And the first words of Bathsheba goes uh, straight to the point. 
And he says there in verse uh, well, 16 and 17, he says, uh, you swore to God. I'm just going to add a little bit here, by the way. He says, you swore to God that Solomon, your son, would reign after you and will sit on the throne. You promised this, David. But Adonijah is right now reigning as king and you do not know this. David has been oblivious. It seems like Bathsheba now uh, has been waiting for years for this to happen, finally. Um, and from David's point of view, it seems that he's just been procrastinating, doesn't it? It's just procrastinating to make, make this move um, because maybe he just didn't trust Solomon. Why hadn't David done this? Why hadn't he um, crowned Solomon already? You know, Solomon would have been young. We saw this last week. He would have been young. And uh, we'll see later... Uh, today that he is referred constantly as young and tender by David. Maybe David just didn't wasn't 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 ready to to make Solomon king just just in case didn't fully trust God. But now is the time. And Bathsheba knew this. Um, Bathsheba says that you need to do something now. The people have no idea what's going on. They don't know who to follow. You need to announce them to the nation who is king. Otherwise, this will be a full blown rebellion. And we will all be killed. Don't you understand, David? It, this is critical. And as he said, as um, he said he would, Nathan the prophet, he comes in also and says the same thing. But Nathan is almost quite sarcastic in the way that um, he talks to David. He goes, hi, David. So apparently you have said that Adonijah is king, um, is king to be on the, uh, on the throne, right? You said that. He's just gone down, he's slaughtered the cattle and oxen and sheep, he's taken your men, your men are with him. There are a couple of us, there's me, there's Zadok, there's Benaiah who decided not to follow him. So is this from you David? Did you, did you say this was okay? Or have you decided not to tell me who is going to be king? And you see there's a, lot of, there's a bit of urgency going on between Bathsheba and Nathan who, who take sort of different approaches to the king um, to make sure that David does something. Some action happens. So verse 29, then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. Um, and she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. So sorry, verse 29. And the king swear and said, As Yahweh liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by Yahweh God of Israel, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. He's finally been kicked into action. It took two people, people very close to him, of course, to finally decide something's go to do something. It says, Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reference to the king and said, Let my lord, King David, live forever. And here is a, uh, here, there's a line right there, isn't it? Let my lord, King David, live forever. Forever. It's a line that shows that Bathsheba's total understanding of the situation. By appointing Solomon as king, David himself, David himself, his legacy, would live forever. And she would have full understanding, I believe, of what's going on with the promise to David in, in 2 Samuel 7 as well. That this boy was to be king on the throne. So David calls for his followers to come, come to him. He calls Zadok. He calls Benaiah, he calls Nathan, and they tell him um, that they have to act quickly. This is the time. They can do it really quickly because they know that Adonijah is about to strike. He's up, he's up at, um, in Rogel about to do something. They need to take, you need to go get Solomon. You need to put him on his own mule, his own mule, which no one does, by the way, and bring him down to Gihon and make him king. So let's put ourselves in Solomon's uh, shoes for a minute. What is Solomon doing? Right now, he's probably a young, he's a young man, he's probably in his room, he's, he might be reading a book, he might be writing some poetry, minding his own business, and suddenly there's a bang on the door, and loud voices, and Bathsheba runs in and says, quick, we have to go, this is it. There is trouble brewing, a brewing and we need to make you king, and he's just probably completely thrown. Why is all this happening now? And then we see a procession. We have Zadok the priest. We have Nathan the prophet. We have Benaiah, the king's bodyguard, the Cherethites, the Pelethites. And then Solomon on the king's mule on a journey out of Gihon in the east. 
and riding the king's mule. And it's a serious thing that no one ever, ever did this. It was only reserved for the king. But Solomon sat upon the, the uh, young mule. You can see on the screen there, he's a king with a priest and a prophet with him. And we can hear the echoes, can't we? We can see, we can see the king coming through Jerusalem on a mule. People finally accepting his, him as king. A king, a prophet and a priest all rolled into one. A great vision of Christ riding with the children singing hosannas to him. So while Adonijah and his men are doing a secret anointing in Enrogel nearby, Solomon is anointed by Zadok the priest in verse 39. It says, And Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him, and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth rent with the sound of them. Amazing. And who was the first person to hear this? Well, it was the very, very well-trained ears of Joab. He heard the first trumpet blast. He had uh, probably heard a little bit of commotion, a fair bit actually, going through the city. What did all this mean? What was all this, these people rushing around for? Maybe the king was dead finally. Maybe this was our chance. But there was no questions when, uh, no question of what was going on when Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, and Cain and told him four things. David has made Solomon king. Solomon is already enthroned in the palace. Already. The king has sealed the appointment with a prayer to God. And Sol Jonathan must have been there because he has a very detailed eyewitness um, he says that David bowed himself upon his bed. So panic immediately sets in with Adonijah. He's lost all the initiative. Timing on, timing on these particular sort of coups, coups are, are sort of the most important thing. Um, they're in big trouble now. They have to just run. They just scatter. Adonijah feared. Of course he would he'd be scared. It was obvious uh, that all this had happened so fast because of him. So he just runs away. He heads to the nearest altar that David sets up. He grabs the horns and he pleads for sanctuary and refuge. This is it. It's all over for him. Absolutely done. Solomon's been made king, even while David was still alive, which is a fairly rare. And he hears about Adonijah fearing for his life. And Adonijah needs mercy from the now king, Solomon. So if this was on the other hand, and Adonijah was the one, well, if Solomon was the one pleading mercy for Adonijah, how do you think Adonijah would react? I think Solomon would be dead in a heartbeat, wouldn't he? If, in fact, if anybody stood up against him, you wouldn't need much imagination to think what he would do. But Solomon, he's quite young, he's... Uh, he has other ideas. He's, he's quite wise for his age. He does nothing. And Solomon said here that if he shows himself a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So he's given him an ultimatum. Wickedness, he'll die. If he's a worthy man, he will live. And in verse 53, so King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, and he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. He bowed himself to the king in the, and Solomon said, go to your house. Short of shows a lot of maturity already, doesn't it? Um, a lot of wisdom to, in, in itself to make this sort of ultimatum, um, showing mercy to a man who was uh, very close to having Solomon killed. He definitely would have. Show yourself worthy or die. And we're going to see how Adonijah and his follow, followers react to this uh, crowning of Solomon. Probably more next week. So Solomon has been anointed king now, along with David. So they've sort of been a bit of a co-regency now. Um, a succession plan has begun. It's been put in place. David's old, he's weak, he's, he's going to die soon. Everyone knows this. In fact, if you read at the start of uh, 1 Kings 1, it looks like he's basically on his deathbed. 
until finally he'd, he realised that you know, they had to get kicked into action. And now we're going to see a real vitalisation, a revitalisation of David. You know, he's determined to make sure Solomon uh, is as equipped as possible to, to be king and to obviously set up the, the house of God, which he spent so many years of his life preparing and dedicating his life to. And he had the strength to continue this last bit of work before his death. He says in Psalm 71, he pleads to God to be his rock, his refuge, to deliver him from evil. Verse 18, even when I'm old and grey-headed, do not forsake me and, and um, forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to, to all who are to come. He needed this last bit of strength, didn't he, to, uh, to help him from God. The story of uh, Solomon has a has a fair uh, a lot of parables and a lot of types, um, as you know. One in King uh, First of Kings. Uh, there's actually a par sorry. There's a para parallel record. One in First of Kings and one in uh, Chronicles. Uh, Chronicles is a lot of Chronicles details the preparation um, of the building of the temple. It's uh, almost written exclusively for that purpose. So when we turn to the first of Chronicles, um, we can see how David prepared with a passion um, that is so intense. It was so intense. It was so important to him. This is almost like the one thing he wanted to do was to build the house. And when now that he couldn't build the house, the one thing he wanted to do was Solomon to build the house. That was his sole purpose is to make sure Solomon built the house. It was work that we know that started all the way back in 2 Samuel 7 when God uh, asked him to, well, when he asked God to build, build a house. But it was a work for somebody else, for his son. Um, David was devastated, of course, but he knew um, that he could set in place the things that would make the temple build, the running of it, as smoothly as possible. Uh, it's a work that he would have planned probably before Solomon was even born. Once he realised that um, there was going to be a house being built by somebody, he's like, I'm going to do this straight away. And he would have started actively gathering materials before his first uh, coronation especially. So for those first 20 odd years, um, he would have been very active in doing this. So let's turn there to um, the first of Chronicles. And we're going to go to chapter 22. First of Chronicles 22. We're going to read verse 1. And it says, Then said David... This is the house of Yahweh God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. That's all it says. This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar. So David's chosen this location for the temple. Like, what location was it? Well, basically, chapter 22, the should really be a, is basically an extension of chapter 21. There shouldn't even be a chapter break up there. So we have to go back to chapter 21 to actually work out what he's, what he's saying here. This is the house of the Lord God. And it's a very long chapter. We're not going to, it's a very intense chapter, chapter 21. Um, it's a very unusual story of David commanding Joab to number all Israel because he had been provoked by Satan. Finally, he had found the right place. He'd been looking for years. It's always been on his mind. Psalm 132. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for Yahweh, a mighty place for the mighty one of Jacob. And finally he had found the place for God, a place for the ark to rest. David had been trying to get the ark to rest. You know, he, he, had, he had had it, he'd lost it. Um, he had lost it again, he had it, he lost it. It had happened all through his, uh, through his life. Um, it was now in Gibeon in the tabernacle, a place which was movable, a place where God could not fully rest. And the ark was, a, was symbolic of how the land was, wasn't it? It was just... It wasn't finally at peace, and that's what um, David wanted to be. Finally at peace, and it needed to be rested in a place. Rested in that house. And David knew that 
Um, it's very interesting, the location of this. This is um, in Mount Moriah. But it was a threshing floor. A threshing floor is a very humble place, the sort of place that God wants for his house. It was a simple, unadorned place. Not like a fancy church at all. It was a place of ordinary work. A place bought with money. A place where bread came from. A place where the justice of God was evident. A place where sin was confessed. A, and a, a place where sacrifice was offered and accepted a per, and perfect for the house of God. You know, in this man, Ornan the Jebusite, who is named Aruana, in, if you want to make a, make a note, Aruana, Aruna, which I think is, is basically another word for king. That's in 2 Samuel 24. Um, that's his name. It's, it's basically a king. He may have been the king or lord of, the, of that land, um, and he was a very just man who sold this place for God's purpose. That's what he wanted. He wanted, when, when he saw David and, and, and did the altar, he wanted David to have it. This is the threshing floor on Mount Moriah. The location we know from history was where Solomon built his temple. So now we've come to First of Chronicles 22. He has declared that this is where the house is to be built. And he starts preparations straight away. So let's have a look at the lengths that David, uh, the lengths that David went to to prepare the building of the temple. So chapter 22, <clears throat> David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David then starts to gather strangers that were in the land of Israel, probably the proselytes who dwelt, uh, dwelt in the land, and he started to set some things in order. He sets stonemasons to hew wrought stones. He prepares iron in abundance for nails, for hinges, for hardware. Uh, lots of materials, brass in abundance without weight. A hundred thousand talents of gold. A hundred thousand talents of gold. Does anyone want to have a stab at what a hundred thousand talents of gold is worth today? Anyone know? There's a stab. Well, I'll tell you, it's around about $150 billion. That much is. And, um, and then there's a hundred, uh, uh, sorry, a thousand thousand talents of silver, which is a million. Um, and that is around about $16 billion now um, of, of silver. So it's a fair bit of, it's a fair bit of stuff. You know, $150 billion worth of gold. They've got work, he's got workmen in abundance. He's got carpenters and stonemasons or and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. It says that they have his gold, sil silver, brass, iron with that number. It probably means that there's lots more left where, it, where that came from. Um, and the cedar trees, the cedars of Lebanon. He had cedar trees in abundance from Zidon and Tyre. It's now the timber used. It's the best timber you can find. You know, it's beautiful stuff. Cedars of Lebanon. It's beautiful. And through our history, it's very, uh, very highly spoken of and described throughout the Bible as strong and durable in Isaiah. Grace and beautiful in Psalm 80, verse 10. High and tall and fragrant. So it's, it's, these are mentioned in the scripture as amazing trees. That The best, the best. And that's all he wanted. He wanted the best for the... Uh, for the temple that Solomon was, his son was to build, and we learn uh, there that he he's got it in abundance from Zion uh, and Tyre. We see that David has a very good relationship with Tyre, um, or mainly Hiram, the king of Tyre in the north. It says that, in fact, that Hiram was a lover of David, and a very loyal man to David, who agrees to trade with him and Solomon to build this magnificent temple. And Tyre was a, a mighty um, economic centre for maritime trade and commerce. And Hiram held a monopoly of all this area. The Mesopotamian trade routes that stretched across the sea. It was, a wealthy, it was a very wealthy place with many goods that were traded all over the world. This was the place. This was the place. A metropolis. And although David had uh, conquered many of the lands, lands surrounding him, he kept Tyre as a very close ally. 
which came in handy when uh, needing materials to build the temple. And Hiram helped David to build his house with the best skilled tradies in the land. And Hiram probably would have, would have uh, profited from this too, knowing God was on his side and, and keeping good relations with David was a good investment. A great relationship that was later passed down to Solomon uh, when he began to build the temple properly. And unfortunately, David's, uh, sorry, Solomon's family and his sons and ancestors ruined the relationship later on. But verse 5, David says, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. It's words that we hear so often um, from David really shows how David really feels about his son, isn't it? He's so different to Solomon and it seems like he almost just doesn't trust or trust him to prepare the house. That's why he had to do so much himself. Oh, my son, he's so young, he's so tender. We, I'm, I'm going to do it all myself. He almost needs to be wrapped in cotton wool and, and needs his hand held, held every step of the way. And I believe David saw in him, in his son, a characteristic that he himself had. I'm not talking about the fact that he was, um, you know, a quieter or some more sensitive child. I think he saw that maybe a trait that was his greatest weakness as well. So all parents know their sons and daughters better than anyone. And by this age, he would have... Uh, known full well the problems that Solomon had. I think he did. We know later in life that Solomon's weaknesses for women, which David suffered as well, was his downfall. His, his very trigger-happy attitude to please his wives in any way possible. Maybe David saw this in his son, even from an early, st early stage, because he is adamant and persistent in his speech throughout the chapter and throughout the whole final years of his life, that Solomon has to cling to the word of God. That's what David tells him the whole time. He repeats it and repeats it, to remember God now in your youth. So he doesn't depart from it when he's older. It's a tough job keeping your children uh, you know, dedicated to the truth. It's, it is a hard job. And it's vital to do from a young age, because if you let them do their own thing for the first few years of their life, the world will eat them alive and it's just too mesmerising for him. David said, Solomon, my son, he's young and tender and the house that is to be builded for Yahweh must be exceeding magnificent. Of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death and then he called Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for Yahweh, God of Israel. So he charged him. He charged him to build a house uh, for, for God. The word charged here is basically, I'm trying to work out, can anyone help me which verse I'm up to? I haven't actually written in my notes. It's verse, six. verse 6. Yes, there you go. Verse 6 of chapter 22. Then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build the house. So the word charge is basically command. This is where he stands in front of a very young, tender Solomon. He passes the plans to him and says, Son, your job is to build the house. For God. So this is a story of, a, of the next generation, isn't it? The next generation needing to shoulder the responsibility to carry on the work of building God's house. So the older generation, David in this case, but the older generation has done a great job in building the ecclesias up, instilling the right principles godly attitudes and we're very thankful for that as a young person I'm very grateful for that and it's it's up to us the younger generation to make sure we continue that good work because we're all part of this building process things do change we all know that but to keep those very core principles the important things to continue that work is very important because David is very old he is he's desperate to make sure he, he was so important to make sure the generation next after him continues God's work he sees that and now he, he, that's why he's trying to he's trying to tell him my son as for me it was in my mind to build the house unto the name of God he wanted to do it all himself but the word God came to me and uh, the, the word of Yahweh came to me saying thou hast shed blood abundantly 
You've made great wars. You, you shall not build a house unto my name, because you've shed too much blood. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will, I will give him rest from all the enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, in verse 9. I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. It's a complete total contrast to David, isn't it? Such different characters. He shall build a house in my name. He shall be a son. I will be his father. I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, Yahweh be with you and prosper thou. And build the house of Yahweh thy God as he has said of thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. And give thee charge concerning Israel. That thou mayest keep the law of Yahweh thy God. Thou shalt prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which Yahweh charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. And for 40 years, 40 years up to this point, David had been king. He is near the end. Solomon needs to step up. All he wanted to do is bring his people into a state of rest. David did. He wanted to build a place where Yahweh could uh, dwell among them and be at ultimate rest. All his life he had gathered materials, spoils from war to make this happen. But he was so close. He was so close. But unfortunately God said, sorry David, you don't fit that type. It had to be passed on to a younger man. What is the echoes here? And anyone hear the echoes? 40 years. And right at the end, he couldn't quite get there into the land of rest. He had to pass it on to someone else. Moses and Joshua. It's the same story. It's the same story. We could read the side by side. Moses gave Joshua a charge. It says, I charge you. I cannot go over the River Jordan. It says in... Um, in Joshua, but I'm going to pass it on to Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, verse 7 to 8, it says, Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with these people unto the land which Yahweh hath shown unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And Yahweh said, He, he, uh, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with you, he will not fail you, neither forsake you, fear not, neither be dismayed. It's almost word for word, isn't it? When we read back in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 13, we see the same things that he wrote. He said that and Moses said the same to Joshua. David understands this is the same story. David actually does understand it. He had led the people wonderfully as a shepherd. He had brought them to this point, but the baton is now handed down to a man like Joshua who fitted the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua and Solomon. Words that are riddled throughout the book of Joshua. Yahweh encourages Joshua with words like, be not afraid, be of good courage, I am with you. And is uh, used by David to Solomon. And later in his life, in David's final address to Israel, he says to Solomon again in First of Chronicles 28, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For Yahweh, God, even my God, will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of my God. It's just repeated. It's always repeated by David making sure that he kept the charge. So I don't think we need to be a genius to see that, um, that they're both the same. This is that David sees the links here. And um, that Solomon's responsibility is to bring the, the people to a place of rest, and Joshua bringing the people, obviously, into the land that was promised to them, are both, they're both future prophecies of the age to come. And Solomon is taking the reins now to build a magnificent temple. This is, what he was, this is what he's born to do. A place where God can rest forever and the world can be at peace. And David saw the completion. David saw this. He saw the completion of Joshua's work in Solomon. The ark that had been travelling in tents for years and years and years had still hadn't found rest. And it was the last thing that needed to be done. And it's interesting that the, the final thing that happened... And we'll see this later when the temple is built. The very final thing that happened is that they pulled the staves out of the ark. And that's when the, that's when the glory of God filled the temple. And that's the point. That is the highest point of God's kingdom that has ever been. 
at the height of its glory. We'll ne- and we have never seen that again. It's an amazing link that draws our mind to the future age where we can be both part of these amazing prophecies. And after giving Solomon this charge, he had charged him, he then commands the princes to help him. He commands the... He asked the princes to help Solomon build the sanctuary for God. And if we look at verse 1 of the next chapter, chapter 23, it says that when David was old, he made Solomon king over Israel. Seems like the perfect scenario. He's given him a charge and uh, some lovely words of encouragement now. Not long later, he's made king. There you go, chapter 23, verse 1. He's made king over Israel. But if we look over and just flick over to chapter 29... And verse 22, it says there, They did eat and drink before Yahweh on the day with great gladness, and they made Solomon the son of David king the second time. Hmm, the second time. So when was this first time? Well, we've already seen it. We already dealt with that in our reading. That was during the time of civil war and unrest when Adonijah threatened to overtake the throne. So it was after he had found the temple location, after he had gathered materials, after he had charged Solomon, after he had commanded the princes to help him, then he was crowned king over Israel. It's pretty obvious now that Adonijah decided to take the throne, isn't it? He had to exalt himself if he wanted to do it. He conferred with Joab of Bitha, who obviously knew what was going on. The princes had just been... One of the princes just told me that that he'd help Solomon, the king, who's going to be king, to build the uh, the temple. He's now committed high treason of the greatest order. That's what Adonijah did. He deliberate rebellion because he knew. He knew that he wasn't going to be king. He knew Solomon had been appointed. Instead of getting into line... He wanted the power for himself. He knew he was old. He's like, let's just do it now before you know, David actually does something. And we, well, we did see that David acted in time. He sprung into action to make sure that the oath made by God was not broken. And now this is a time of, of co-regency. It's about 12 months. David needs to put everything in order to have the running of God's house. It seems to be the, the last year of David's life. And although he was bedridden, he was sick and all that, in chapters um, uh, 23 to 27, he's galvanised to, to go and you know, do all this stuff. In the last few months before his death, he, he changes the entire course of the religious and the government duties of the nation. This is what he does. He sets out the Levitical duties in chapter 23. He changes the ages of the priests from, from, uh, from the ages of uh, from 30 to 20. So now you can be 20 to be a priest. He sets out the 24 courses of the priests in chapter 24. He sets out the singers in their various companies. He sets up the courses of the porters. He sets up the Levites with the treasures of the house of God. He establishes a religious judicial system. He establishes 1,700 Levites on the west, 27 on the east, as officers in the business of Yahweh. And we read that, read that in t- chapter 26. And this is all done in the last year of his life. Because in chapter 26, verse 31... Chapter 6, 26, verse 31, it says that in the 40th year of the reign of David, they were sought for. So this is in the 40th year, which we know that was the 40th year of his reign is when he died. So he changes the whole government and religious establishment in the kingdom, a man on a mission to make sure the government structures are in place before he dies. And the final act of David, he gathers everyone together, basically the whole entire land, he gathers together in one grand assembly. And uh, chapter 28, verse 1, tells us who he gathered. He gathered these people, the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, the captains over thousands, the captains over hundreds, the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king, and of his sons, The officers, the mighty men, the valiant men. This is everybody. This is basically anybody whose anybody was there. They were all gathered to Jerusalem. These are the final words to the nation before he dies. And he needs to finally pass over 
to Solomon as king. We won't go into um, chapter 28 in any detail. We do not have the time. So as a bit of a chapter breakdown, chapter 28, um, it's verse 1, David gathers a grand assembly to Jerusalem. Verse 2 to 10, David explains to the assembly God's plans to make Solomon a king. And he pleads with them to listen to him and serve him as God with all their hearts. Verse 11 to 12, he gives Solomon the patterns of the porch, the houses, the treasuries, the upper chambers, inner parlours, the place of the uh, mercy seat, the courts of the temple, and so on, so on. Basically the plans of, the, of God's house. Verse 13, all the courses that we, we read about in, in, uh, that we saw in chapters 23 to 27 that David set up, they were given to him to run. They said, this is yours now, I've, I've set it all out, now yours, you can, you can deal with that. Verse 14 to 19, he basically says, here Solomon, here's all the materials I've gathered for you over the years, for everything you need. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be immaculate, it's all made of gold, this has to be the best. He details everything down to the last tiny thing, all the things that need, to, need making, a formal giving over of the plans for God's house. Verse 20, be strong and of good courage again, he says it, and do it. Fear not, be not dis dismayed, for Yahweh, God, even my God, will be with you nor forsake you until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of Yahweh. Verse 21, the priests and Levites will help you as well. And we, we, see, we see here a pattern of our ecclesia, don't we? Right, right there. Of the kingdom of God world, oh, sorry, of the ecclesia of God worldwide. A man who has spent all his life, this is David, spent all his life preparing to be in that glorious kingdom. And he's prepared the way for someone else, for others, for the next generation. But he cannot enter himself. Not at this time. As generations come... And they go in our, ecclesi our ecclesias, don't we? We see that there's a passing on of that responsibility to others. So that others in the next generation, to ours, they can carry on that mantle and carry that forward to continue building the house of God. Because there's three types of houses we're reading about here. Three types. There's the literal story we're reading, which is the house, of, a house built by Solomon. We're going to read about that. We're going to see that later on in our studies. We're talking about the future house built, in the, uh, built by Christ in the kingdom, which we look, look forward to, you know, when God's glory will fill the earth. And the house we are building right now in our lives, we, we are building each other up. It's almost the most, it's the most important one right now in our lives. We're creating living stones for that kingdom age. And we may say to ourselves, well, there's been so many that have gone before us. They've set up the ecclesia pretty well. I don't have to con contribute. Look at all the old members. They've, they've got, they're, all, they're always here. They're always here. They've got everything under control. David has everything under control, right? He's thought of everything. He's contributed materials for years and years and years. There was tons of stuff. And even including how the government was to be run. He did everything. But our mentors... Those who we look up to for spiritual help, they're not going to always be there. They might be an inspire, inspiration to us. They're not going to be there forever. So can the younger generation contribute? Well, can, can we take the charge to build God's temple? Well, there's a little phrase <clears throat> written in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14, I'd like to look at. I'm going to put it on the screen. First of Chronicles 22. I'm going to read it from the NIV. He says, Now behold, in my trouble, in my pain, my old age, I have taken great pains, he says, to provide for the temple of Yahweh a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron, too great to be weighed, and wood and stone Sounds like he has everything he needs, right? He's prepared everything. He's thought of everything. But there's a message for us right at the end of that, that verse. And this is what it is. And you may add to them. He, there was, he had, would have had access to anything that he wanted. But he says, you may add to them. Because we can add to it too. Not because it hasn't been prepared before, because it has. 
But we have to continue to build God's house together. And we will see later in um, the study, God willing, how working together to build this house is so important, especially now as we see the day of the Lord approaching fast. Because it will take us take courage. But we need not to fear and observe. We need not to fear, but to observe God's instructions, and He will never leave us or fail us until that house is built.